Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming one of the great horror villains of all time, TJ from My Bloody Valentine. Paul Kilman is coming on the show today, and uh, we're going to talk about the cult phenomenon of that movie, because uh, tomorrow is Valentine's Day. And um, he was also in the cult classic comedy Gas. And um, he was also in the horror classic Black Roses. And so I'm going to talk to him about all that stuff, find out why he's not acting in movies anymore, and see if he still does, if, or if he's ever done the uh, horror convention circuit. And it's going to be pretty cool. So, uh, yeah, here is my interview with Paul Kelman. Hey, Paul, welcome to the show. How are you, sir? I'm uh, good, thank you. Awesome. This is such a great honor. Thank you for taking the time today. My pleasure. So... Going back in time, uh, did you gravitate toward acting early on? Yeah, I think I probably, probably around 9 or 10, actually got hit a draft when I was 12. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I started pretty early. I think most actors do. Yeah. You know, you get the bug as a kid. Yeah, did you um, do school plays and community theater and all that? Not community theater, no. Yeah, I did high school plays. And I, I took drama lessons when I was around Canton. On well, about Canton, Canton 11, 12, I think. I was uh, taking acting lessons. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it, you know, it was all part of whatever growing up is when you're a kid. And I guess, uh, I, guess I got the buck. I used to watch a lot of... TV in the afternoon when I was skipping school, <laughs> and uh, I used to watch a lot of folk art movies. Oh, love those! Country folk art. Yeah, yeah, back in the '40s, and uh, which was really all that was on during those days because you know those were early days in terms of TV programming or TV at all. But anyway, yeah, all those uh, film noir uh, films like folk art, I, I I really watched a lot of that. And, uh, was, yeah, that really kind of captured me from the acting point of view, from the film point of view, really. Mm -hmm. Those were great films back then. Anyway, they meant a lot to me, so I, I, uh, it influenced me a great deal, I know that. Yeah, Key Largo, Dark Passage, The Big Sleep, re really great movies he did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, in Casablanca. Casablanca, of course, everyone's... Yeah. Always have to talk about that one and um, Treasure of the Sierra Madre. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's funny because I, I, I have often said I don't really watch the same movie more than, you know, once. But that's not true, I discovered. Like, I've seen Casablanca at least ten times, you mm -hmm. know. And maybe even once every <clears throat> year or two, I'll revisit that film or a Maltese Falk in one of those. And, uh, yeah, and then... Another film I, I, I've been watching over again many times is uh, oh, Blade Runner, the original. I oh, love it. I think it was 1982, I think. Anyway, that one I've seen many, many times. I think that is a, a, a phenomenal uh, film, especially in the science fiction genre. But um, just all in all, it's an amazing film. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's a there's quite a few I've discovered, you know. And I, I seem to watch some horror movies over and over again, especially back in the old days when I used to watch uh, horror films from the, I guess, you know, from the Hammer films, for example. Yeah. Uh, all the films about Dracula and Frankenstein and, you know, mm -hmm. those were my, I loved those films when I was a kid. Yeah, I just... I used to go to the all night. All night horrorama, just to uh, watch horror, horror films for eight, you know six eight hours. Yeah, I just interviewed. Anyway, I just interviewed a later yeah. day uh, Hammer actress uh, Judy Matheson. Heard the name. Yeah, 
She did like uh, Lust for a Vampire and stuff like that. Early seventies. Yeah. yeah. You're you're originally from London. I was born here, yeah, but I, I, I really didn't stay there any any time at all. I was whisked away to uh, France where my parents live. And we lived in Paris until I was I don't know, five or six or somewhere in there. And we moved to Canada. So originally I was grew up as a little French guy. I couldn't even speak English. Oh really? <laughs> Yeah, no, I didn't know English. I just knew French. And when we got here, I had to learn English. And it was quite a shock. I'll tell you. But, um, yeah, I've always wanted to go back. And somehow I just haven't managed to do it. <coughs> and, uh, yeah. I think the last time I was in Europe was like when I was 15. And that was about it. Yeah. So, uh, I'm up, up for it now, Maybe. Maybe. Yeah, every time I meet somebody who tells me that they had, had trouble learning English when they were younger, I can never believe it because they just speak it so perfectly now. You know, it's like it, it like you know that like it, they always spoke that way. You know. Yeah, and besides, when I when I, I went to the theater school back in nineteen sixty nine to seventy three, I think somewhere in there, and um, yeah, they had to learn how to speak English properly. You know, they try to train you in the English tradition, i.e. the British tradition. Um, but it's kind of hard because we don't really talk like that here in Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, Canada, -der, as the Brit would say. Canada. -der. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. What part of Canada uh, did you grow up in? I, I grew up in the capital city of Canada, Ottawa, it's called. Ottawa, yeah. And, uh, yeah, and, you know, that's like Washington, D.C., kind of very, you know, it's a uh, political town. Um, but they had, I, I went to an excellent high school when I was there, and they had a very a very dominant, uh, uh, well-known drama club. And um, <clears throat> that was a very good experience, actually, because we got to travel around a little bit and see other productions. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we competed in productions as well. So, yeah, that was a pretty exciting time. I learned a great deal uh, during that period of time. Yeah, were, were any um, Canadian actors in your class that uh, later went on to become successful? Uh, let me think. Well, one of my best friends was, uh, um, he became, uh, he was part of a, he became part of a, uh, a pop group called the Nine Lines. I don't know if you've ever heard of them. Uh, doesn't yeah, ring a bell. Well, they were known internationally. Anyway, so they were a, 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 an a cappella group, in other words, they didn't use music. Right. Their, back, their voices were the music. And um, they were very well known. And they traveled around Europe and Australia and uh, the U.S. and Canada. Anyway, he was, uh, yeah, he was my best friend back then. And uh, we kind of went different ways. He went into, into singing. And um, he was one of the originators of the group. And I went on to, you know, what I've, what I've done. Uh, yeah. I, but I can't think of anybody else who's, you know, any names that you would know. Although yeah. when I was 12, uh, my little drama class there, where I learned how to be an actor at 12 years old, which uh, Saul Rubinick was in my class. Oh, yeah, Saul Rubinick. <laughs> yeah. And uh, who else? There's quite a few actors from Ottawa who made it. And I just can't, my, my mind's just not there right now. I can't remember. But there's a few people who, who you know, made a significant difference who I knew quite well. Um, but I found out early, I was, you know, by the time, by 1986, well, definitely by 1990, mm -hmm. I had pretty well stopped acting. Yeah, I've, I've interviewed. I, I, Oh, sorry. No, I, I, I was going to say, I've interviewed so many wonderful Canadian actors. Um, everyone from Lynn Griffin to Art Hindle to Leslie Donaldson. Yeah. A lot of great Canadian actors. Yeah. Uh, I think there are a lot. Yeah. Yeah. The industry isn't exactly the most exciting industry at, at the moment. I think maybe 
yeah. you know, people are pretty hyped up when they're working, but to be honest, most from what I see, the problem has always been that they make American films here in Canada because it's cheaper, right? And because the they have to hire so many Canadians, but the Canadians pretty well always play like subordinate roles, right? And the star or stars are usually uniquely American, although sometimes you'll get a, 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 a Canadian actor working opposite the American one. Uh, in a more or less equal role, but still the other guy is the star. It's pretty well like that. And um, I, I've never, I never thought that this was good. It's not a good industry that way, because it's really, we're, really, we're just on the coattails of the, the American industry. And they take advantage of us. And uh, mm. you don't get paid, but the Americans get paid. Yeah. <laughs> <Believe me. laughs> and, uh, like I did, I did this movie Jazz, and I think Donald Sutherland came in for, I think it was three days, and he got paid $175,000. And yeah. I worked per week. I think I was, I think I was getting 500 a day. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I worked for like three weeks or four weeks or five weeks, I can't remember. Uh, yeah, so, you know, that was then. I think it's still true now. I think um, actors might be getting paid, uh, you know, more competitive salaries in Canada. I'm not sure, though. Um, and, you know, budgets are whatever they are. Who makes really good films in Canada? Not the English part of Canada, but the French part. Yeah. Uh, they make international films. I think that their, their stuff is really good. I've seen a ton of films from Quebec that I, I thought were really well made. And especially the ones that are made by as the six uh, First Nations people in, in Canada, they have a really thriving film industry, and their films are really good. They just don't get mainstream, uh, uh, you know, showings. I agree. I think okay. ca- the Canada makes just wonderful films. You know, they're just so talented in just you know filmmaking, acting, comedy. Of course, we've seen so many funny Canadians. You gotta see the humor of things, you know, when you live this far north. Yeah. <laughs> Except cool. for right now, we're having an extremely mild winter. Oh yeah. Although, yeah, tonight it's supposed to go down really cold. But that's like a real first. We've only had like maybe four days of snow. Uh, and it's crazy. I mean, you know, the states in the in the the, the Midwest aren't you having like huge snow problems? and all kinds of things are still happening. Yeah, we, we have uh, sun over here in Redding, California, where I live, and it's it's great, yeah. you know, because it, it rains pretty bad during the winter time, and I'm glad we have sun right now. Yeah, I, I envy you. I, I love California. <laughs> Did you ever live out here? No, I came down here to audition for some things, and then I... After I quit acting, I got into technology, and I was, I had my own little company, which was based around virtual reality, and uh, anyway, that brought me down to California a couple of times, uh, mm-hmm. and once I was up, uh, they were kind of auditioning me as for CEO of the company, mm-hmm. uh, of another company, and uh, and another time I went there to audition for whatever I auditioned for, I can't even remember. I even auditioned for a game show. Oh. This actually gets really funny uh-huh. when you do that. You know? I mean, everybody, they, they interview each individual, they ask you all kinds of questions. But what they want you to do is be a personality. Hopefully, you've done some acting before, so you can, you know, do that. And yeah. So, over, over react to everything. Um, and they really put you through the, the, the faces just to find out if you're going to be good enough for them to, you know, to make, make, Winning or losing, exciting. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, that was quite, that's quite an experience. It was like a cattle call. I don't think I've ever been on a cattle call before. Mm-hmm. I've been down in states a few times for different things, like I auditioned in New York, and uh, you know, like I can Most actors do the rounds, right? You just yeah. Go to New York and LA and see what you can. If anything will happen, <laughs> but yeah. maybe if you want to live there, but that's pretty tricky. Yeah. 
According to IMDb, your first movie was called Caged Men. Yeah, it was a really silly thing. Uh, <laughs> uh, there was a porn actress in it, though. What was her name? It wasn't exactly, it wasn't a porn movie, but yeah. there were pornographic elements to it. Uh, and I was trying to think of, um, oh, she, she that famous, uh, famous porn star from, from like the 70s. I um, think. Not Linda Lovelace. No, not Linda, but the other one. That, um, there were two of them. There was Linda Lovelace. And Marilyn Chambers. Marilyn Chambers, yeah. Yeah, I think she did Behind the Green Door. Yes. I think that's the name of the, the movie. Anyway, that, that made her famous. Anyway, she was in so-called Cage Men. It was mm-hmm. called Cage Men in the States only. In Canada, it was called I'm Going to Get You, Elliot Boy. <laughs> yeah, I see. But, you know, it was really crazy. Anyway, it was a terrible movie. Low, low budget, and it was written by a next con who wanted to tell his story, and the story was uh, real. Um, it was just a BS. You know, he just made it up. None of it was real. It was really silly. Mm-hmm. But anyway, we, I, you know, it was my first. That was my first film, and it got a little bit of distribution, and I, I actually I've never seen it. So I haven't either. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even think about it. Um, yeah, there's a couple of films I've done that I've never seen. They're not worth seeing anyway, so that's uh, <laughs> no big loss. Yeah, but ten years later, you do the classic comedy, Gas. No, it wasn't classic. <laughs> <laughs> I used no, to... No, it was really bad. It, 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 got, it, it did really bad with Black Lives. And when I saw it, I thought it was a terrible film. <clears throat> I, I used to watch it all the time on Comedy Central because they used to play it a lot back in the 90s. What? Yeah. <laughs> Wait a minute. You're, are you talking about the same movie that I'm in? Yeah. It was it, it was one of three movies I could think of that, that got played a lot on Comedy Central back then. I don't believe it. Yeah. Really? <laughs> yeah. Did you think it was funny? I thought it was it was cheesy. It had, had a great cast, though. The cast was amazing. It's just that the editing was terrible. The, st- the storyline was pretty junky. Yeah. And uh, I, I don't know. It was just so... Uh, it's one of those car chase films. Basically, that's what it is, right? Yeah. So it's just a, a, another version of a car chase film. And in this case, where there's tons of cars chasing tons of cars. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I thought it was pretty crazy, I'll tell you. I had to I had to drive a milk tanker tanker. Mm-hmm. I've never driven a tanker in my life. Never buying. This was like a really big deal. This thing was huge. It took like fifteen different moves in order to just go from zero to starting the engine and moving the truck. And it really is quite. Uh, anyway, I had to learn it. Like I had something like three to six minutes to learn how to drive the thing. Yeah. Things happen like that all the time, you know. You get you get thrown a curve where they they expect you to you know do, be able to do a not necessarily a stunt, although driving one of those tankers through an alley and out onto a street without hitting anything I, for me was a big stunt. They were really lucky I, that I, I I pulled that off at one time. Mm-hmm. Anyway. You, you know, it's like in my body, sometimes there's all kinds of things in there you've you never ever done before. You know, like <laughs> jump onto a, a moving uh, one of those plywood cars there that are on the on the rails in the mine. And, you know, it's just really a box on wheels, you know. Mm-hmm. Other boxes connected to it. And you just, you know, rip it along, like going downhill way, way down into the mine. Like, a lot of noise and thing is just rocking like crazy. You know, it's like an amusement park without the amusement. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, stuff like that, really. And especially with trying to fight on a, on a moving uh, a moving box train. I mean, that's truly really too much. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> we did it. Did, did you There's get... There's always something new. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
did you get to uh, meet the legendary Sterling Hayden? Oh yeah, I spent time. I spent time with Sterling. Yeah, what was he I like? <laughs> what was he like? Right? Yeah. Well, he was killed all the time. Yeah. <laughs> he, he was on hats all the time, the whole time. He is, he was an alcoholic at one point. Right. Interfered with his career um, because he was really a, a big thing in the fifties. Yeah. Johnny Guitar. He's a big star. Yeah. And later on, when he was in uh, 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 The Godfather, mm -hmm. you know, as the police chief. I mean, the guy was an amazing actor. Yeah. But anyways, yeah, he, he just smoked ass all the time. Uh, he never knew his lines. Uh, he, he could be bothered. <laughs> <laughs> he just, you know, so if they had to, like, write things down for him to see, or, or I don't know what, they had different techniques of getting him to say the words that needed to be said. <laughs> Sometimes they just cut lines all together. He wasn't really interested. He just wanted to... You know, he was there. It's a gig, you know, it's a gig, and he was getting paid some money, and uh, the rest are Canadian yokels, and uh, that was it. And he was on his way. And at one time afterwards, we were going to do, we were doing a lot of uh, voice dubbing on certain scenes in the movie, and uh, they had to bring back Sterling from uh, California to uh, to do the to, to do the voice. And we waited, waited, waited a whole day for him, and he, like he didn't show up. Like he was eight hours late. And finally, we found out he was stuck at the border. He'd been arrested because he had some hash on him. <laughs> <laughs> so he couldn't make it. We find so the the, the the studio had to bail him out and everything. Oh. And um, yeah, it was really funny. And and then finally, he showed up the next day. <laughs> God, I mean, you it's... never, you know, you never think something like that's going to happen, but it did anyway. Yeah, <laughs> that was uh, Ali Mandel's first ever movie, by the way. Yes, and also uh, Dan Aykroyd's brother Peter was in it, and um, yeah. and the uh, Vlasta Veranda, who's been on the podcast, great, great actor, great guy. He doesn't remember most of the movies he made, unfortunately. <laughs> well, I'm kind of like that too. I mean. You're talking 30, 40 years ago, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, at least right now, type. But yeah, stuff on the interim, I don't know. He was, yeah, last was, uh, yeah, he was good to work with. And uh, Peter Ackroyd was a complete, he was a maniac. Really? <laughs> I just love, yeah, I love the guy. He was just so funny all the time. Yeah, he's a funny guy. Yeah. Yeah, he was a he, he was a real terror. That guy. God, it was so much fun being with him. And like I say, he was a pretty crazy guy, but just a barrel of laughs. Um, yeah. And who else should you mention there? Um, uh, Susan Anspaugh. I know she's in there. Yeah, Susan. I, I I just love that actress. You know, she died recently. Yeah. That's and, sad. Uh, which was really sad. She was a really good actress. She was a wonderful, she was just a really nice woman, really a nice person. And she had, she was very kind of modest and everything. And yeah, yeah. I spent a lot of time with her because she was really cool. Actually, a lot of people, from the, there, were, there were a lot of really good actors in that movie. A lot of them, yeah. Right. yeah. It's and funny. Keith Knight, of course. Yeah. It's funny how you mentioned before, though, about Donald Sutherland getting paid 175000 because uh, it says here that the only reason he, he said the only reason he did the movie was because he was broke at that time. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. Wow. Can't believe that's all right. That's, well, he was, you know, that's pretty wild. Yeah, well, he was coming off of Ordinary You're People. Yeah, he was coming off of Ordinary People, which, by the way, he should have gotten an Academy Award nomination for, but he didn't. Oh, and, really? Yeah. Wow, I can't believe he did Ordinary People, and then he did this crappy little movie called Gas. You yeah. Know, it was a crappy movie, I, I thought. But at the same time, they did some big things, like we blew up a gas station. Yeah. <laughs> that, was, that was crazy. And what else did they do that was really pretty? The sets were pretty good. Uh, and then we had really good locations for that. I mean, it could have been a, a decent film. It could have been a, a, I don't know what your take on it is. And to tell you the truth, I've only seen it once. So I've probably forgotten more than I remember, you know? Yeah.
Yeah. So you probably have a better perspective on what it was like than I do. Well, you know, like you said, you know, it was that time where people were making car movies, you know, like Burt Reynolds was doing with uh, Smokey and the Bandit and Cannonball Run and stuff like that. But, um, yeah, so I, I, I look at it as, you know, an 80s time ca- capsule of that kind of genre of movies. Yeah, but was it funny? In some places, yes. <laughs> yeah. I haven't, I haven't seen the movie since the 90s, so if I saw it again, I'd probably... Okay. Okay. I'd probably laugh out loud. Her memory is no better than mine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyway, um, what was that? I don't Give me a question, Joy. Okay. How, do, how does um, My Bloody Valentine come into your life? Through Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> no, really. I mean, you know, I, I'd forgotten all about the movie. Um, I mean, 10 years ago, I didn't even think about it. I mean, it just wasn't part of my life. It was, and it was, you know, that life back then. Yeah. And then I, I was on Facebook, and all of a sudden I started getting, I noticed I started getting friend requests from people like, like I didn't know. Right. All over the place. And then I discovered that they were fans of the movie, and they found me on Facebook. And uh, I didn't even know there were fans of the movie. I didn't even know that the movie was considered a cult classic. You know, I just, I just wasn't in the loop with all this stuff. And then, uh, you know, so now I have, I don't know, about 1,500 or something uh, fans from all over the world that uh, I interact with on Facebook, which is cool, which is cool. The fans are great. Some of them I've met. I met some really nice people. I'm from, I, I made some friends as a result. Uh, I don't know, do you know uh, Stacy Lee? Stacy Lee, I've She's heard. Yeah. I've heard of Stacey of, Lee, yeah. A lot of actors for, uh, you know, horror cons and stuff like that. Uh, we've become good friends, her and her, her, her boyfriend. And um, I can't remember who else right now, but there's, there's a few people I've met along the way that are related to my buddy Valentine that I never knew. And then there's just people on online that, you know, because I usually, if a... If, uh, Somebody messages me or whatever about the movie or for, for any other reason. I usually respond. So I, 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 I try to have a relationship to some extent with people, you know, who, who mm-hmm. care about the genre and that film. Yeah. And that's rewarding. I think it's nice. I like that. It's good to interact with these people. I learn a lot from uh, uh, these. Uh, some of them are real horror nerds, you know? Yeah. So, <laughs> They're almost like experts in the genre, and um, I can I can respect that. That's really interesting to me. You know, because that's what you do with it. If that's your whole life and nothing but. Well, I think you're in trouble. But <laughs> other than that, I think you know it's yeah. quite meaningful. And uh, yeah, but I see. I don't. I don't do the con. I don't. I, I've never appeared in any except for. Yeah, I've never appeared uh, at least out of Toronto. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the fans don't get a real chance to meet me and I don't really get a chance to meet them so doing the virtual relationships online uh, I, I probably do it more than other people do it other actors do because I, there isn't any other way to interact with the, with the fans so yeah. and, that's, and that's because my health is I, it, it's not good enough to travel most of the time um, especially if I have to go stateside or to England or something like that where, where I'm invited, even though I would love to go, it usually doesn't work out <laughs> in mm-hmm. terms of my health. I'm 70 now, which is, you know, I was 30. I turned 31 on set when you were doing my brother's down time. Oh. So there's quite a few decades of past since. And, uh, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm not 30 anymore, <laughs> obviously. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah, so I, so far that's been the case. It might change this year. Maybe I'm looking at a couple of things that I'm really interested in doing, and uh, we'll see. It's a, it's a, it's complicated. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. The fans, Facebook. That's, and now I'm on Instagram. I have the Instagram, and I have Twitter, and I have on Twitter. And one thing I like to do is it gives me a platform to talk about 
what I think about things, not just movies, but, you know, life in general and politics, like, like America. Like, yeah. like, you know, <laughs> I mean, you, you guys are going crazy over there. It's just like, it's like this crazy circus happening across the border. Oh, yeah. Don't get me. be going mad. Yeah. Yeah, they'll get me started on the politics. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, right. We won't do that. It's, it's crazy, yeah. But I'm sure we feel the same way. Yeah, but did, but did you get did you get cast because you had done gas for Paramount? No, no. Well, maybe partly, maybe in the final decision. I don't know. <laughs> the way I got cast in the first place was Keith Knight, who mm. you know he played uh, Hollis. <sighs> In uh, my play's out time, right? He was also in, in in gas. In fact, it was his audition, not mine. And he said, "I'm going to an audition this afternoon." We were in Montreal, right, filming gas. Mm-hmm. And he said, "Well, I'm just in this afternoon for a horror movie. You want to come?" <laughs> I said, <laughs> no, I, I have not I, you know, I'm, I haven't been to that like, an audition." And he said, "No, we'll crash it." Mm-hmm. I went, "Oh, I, I've never done that before, crashing an audition." I said, "Okay." So we went there and he introduced, uh, he did his audition and he introduced me to, to the director and producer, whoever was there, mm-hmm. casting agent, and they auditioned me there, uh, out of nowhere, you know, just like that. And then pretty well at the end of the audition, they were pretty well set to, to give me the part. So it's pretty, that's never happened before, you know, where it's like an instant thing. Yeah, it was fate. So, you know? <laughs> okay. Yeah. I don't know. But, uh, yeah, so it was pretty, you know, and next thing you know, we're, we're flying up to uh, the eastern, east coast of Canada um, um, to uh, a province called Nova Scotia, which is a, basically an island, or kind of an island. It's all water <laughs> and fishermen and all of that. And that was, uh, that was interesting. And we got into it, and it was all mine. There was, like, you know, there was two lines up that way. Mm-hmm. One of them, the one that we were in, was a, it's a, called Sydney Mines, and it's uh, it's a, not a, they don't use it anymore. They were kind of turning it into some kind of a hopefully some kind of a tour guide place, uh, you know, yeah, safely tourism. Um, so we got we I guess we I don't know what they did. I guess they rented it for like. A month and a half or whatever, and uh, but it's an actual mine. It was just that it was a lot bigger than most mines, uh, and although there's small tunnels too, but some of them are very big, large, cavernous things. And the, the trick about this was that it's 600 feet beneath the ocean floor. Mm-hmm. Wow! Think about that for a second. Yeah. Like, there's only two coastal mines on the east coast of North America that are like that. Mm-hmm. So you got to, you're way, way, way at the ground. It takes you 22 minutes, practically, to get from being down there up to the surface. Yeah. That's how, that's how high it is, or how, yeah, how deep it is. Um, so, you know, if there's an emergency and everybody has to leave, mm-hmm. you have to do it in shifts of five to six people at a time, plus equipment. And that only happened once where... You know, because you have these huge arc lights down there with emanating a great deal of uh, heat. And, of course, the heat can uh, then heat up the air, which has got, which is rich in gases. Yeah. And you can, uh, you have a spark and the whole thing will ignite. Yeah. So there's a lot of buildup of gases. And what they, you know, they have a way of measuring. And then at one point, they measured it, it was like, you've got to go up now. So, I mean, we all packed up and tried to get up there. It almost took an hour. Yeah. You know, it's not like an emergency. It took an hour. It was really crazy. But we sent, up, we sent the actors up first with the camera. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so we were as valuable as the camera, which is nice to know. Yeah. Wow. Anyway, it was up. Yeah. How was um, working with George Milhaka and the rest of the cast? I think it was George's second feature, I'm not sure. And with most of the cast, they maybe had, some of them had done one film. Uh, mm-hmm. There were a few of us who were 
okay, there were like three tiers of actors, basically. You had actors who had very little, if any, experience. Mm-hmm. And, and you had, they were like, they had a genuine, uh, but they really wanted to do acting, right? Right. And um, then you had actors like me with them, maybe a couple of films and have been acting for, I don't know, uh, at that point, maybe six, seven years professionally. Mm-hmm. And and then you have uh, people like, um, oh, like the guy who played my father. Um, he, like, he and, and uh, I can't name uh, uh, leaving me here, but the woman who played Mabel, for example, the guy who played the sheriff, for example, the guy who played my father, those are all seasoned actors. They've been actors for like 40 years. Right. You know, and some of them are who are, all three, for example, were very well respected in the business and it's done a ton of work, even Hollywood side. So, you know, you have three levels of acting. Uh, so, I, you know, it was really interesting because it all kind of melted together. Yeah. The actors, I think, are what they really made the film. It was, a, it was very, I always say this, it was very, a real genuine uh effort on everybody's part to all get together and do this one film. Um, like there was nobody wandering in any way. You know what I'm saying? The whole thing was concentrated by the actors. So that really worked well. And I think people really responded to that, that kind of energy, mm-hmm. <laughs> which was quite surprising to me. And I think the other thing about it too is that you have a lot of, um, uh, basically, I think part of the, the uh, I don't know what the word is, what drew a lot of people to that film from certain areas, like in the U.S. or England, as yeah. an example, or Australia, is that it, the, the movie represented working class people. Yeah. Not, not urbanites, not uh, spoiled rich kids from university. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> the horror genre there was around basically people who were, no, minors, right? Hard-working people and, uh, you know, no big intellectual uh, message happening or anything. It was just the way that people responded to, I guess, uh, you know, what do you, I don't know. I should ask you, what, what, what do you think it was about? Um, well, speaking for myself, the reason why I've always loved the movie is because I've always had a disdain for Valentine's Day and like that movie represents like my feelings about Valentine's Day, you know, just die, die. Oh. <laughs> I see. Okay. Yeah. I got a T-shirt that you would like. It says it's black and in big white letters with a skull, and under the skull, yeah, there's a, a knife and a fork, and it says eat the rich. Oh yeah, I've seen those. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's an old one from like the sixties. I always liked it, though. Oh, it's an Aerosmith song, okay. too. <laughs> that, uh, relationships is what I was going to say. is mm-hmm. uh, just a big deal in the, in the movie, aside from the horror. I mean, I, I mean, it's a genre, and there are things that happen as a result. Mm-hmm. And there's that hidden, hidden story that's really not an after reality. And, um, uh, but the real thing, I mean, it's called Valentine's. My buddy Valentine, right? So, right. Love and love and horror. <laughs> Hel- <laughs> That's really what you got there. Hel- Helen, uh, Helen Udy, what a sweet lady she is. Yeah, I, I thought she was. Uh, I thought she was really the best in the whole film. Yeah. <laughs> to tell you the truth, I really liked her, her work a lot, and uh, yeah, that that shower scene when they, she gets killed, yeah, is amazing. Uh, and even, I said this on interviews before, mm. I was there when they were shooting that. It was just, it was so real. Like she really pulled it off. Yeah, you almost thought it really happened there for a moment when they switched to the dummy and put it up on the, it was really something I was watching. Yeah, she was very good. It's my favorite. She's a, she has a lot of clowning experience. Did you know that? Have you talked to her? Oh, yeah, I've Did talked to her. I, I, yeah, I talked to her at Halloween time. And uh, oh, yeah? yeah, she was telling me about you know her training and stuff, and how much she loves theater. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, it was. Uh, yeah, I thought for the most part, like the acting was like 
really top notch. If it if it if it wasn't uh, a matter of training, then it was a matter of doing it because you really you really put your heart and soul into it. That was kind of like that, and uh, I really respected that. Yeah, so I thought you know I think that's. That really kind of made the film. I thought the story wasn't bad. Yeah. Um, it wasn't too corny. I mean, the people really didn't know. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Axel and I were told by uh, by uh, Nahalka uh, that um, very good shoot. Well, first of all, nobody would know who the, uh, the killer is until the very end of shooting. Mm-hmm. They wouldn't tell us. So, but they did ask. Um, actual, an actual, <laughs> our two characters to to uh, act a little bit as if maybe we were a guilty party. Mm-hmm. So we already were doing that near the, right from the beginning, although uh, we, neither of us really knew that either of us were really, you know, the one. So we didn't find out until just the day of the shooting, I think, and yeah. they gave us the, the, the sheet. Uh, the new inserts, and uh, and we knew, and then we did, uh, you know, we shot those scenes. Um, but that, like I said, though, it was a total surprise. Although most of the time, I didn't think that it could have been me. But mm-hmm. I just, you know, I figured I'm, I'm the I'm the anti hero, so um, no, I can't, I can't be the guilty one. Yeah, that's the way I figured it. So, uh, yeah, but really the, the heroine of the, of the film is, did you just sneeze? Oh, I just coughed, sorry. <laughs> oh, no, no, it's okay, I was going to say bless you. But, um, yeah, then, um, yeah, the girlfriend is really the one who, who she's the one who picks up the big rock and smashes, smashes the bad guy on the back and knocks him over and then he, uh, the whole uh, things caved in, right? Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I've already practically, like, he shoves me and I go smashing into that post or something like that. And then she whacks him. And then he gets buried. And then the, oh, yeah, you should have been there for the when they pulled that arm out. God, that was funny. <laughs> I mean, when you were actually doing it, right? Yeah. Pulling out this plastic hand, putting this dummy arm. <laughs> it was really <laughs> funny. The, the story. There were some really cool effects to watch to see happen, you know. Yeah, the story. Uh, the story I heard that makes me laugh whenever I I, I think about it is uh, that uh, Carl Marat uh, said um, uh, that he um, would eat lunch in his death scene makeup, and no one wanted to be around him. <laughs> well, yeah, you should have seen. Uh, oh dear. The guy who played Happy, the bartender. Yeah. You know, when he gets a pickaxe through his, through his head and it comes out of his eye. Yeah. Yeah, well, he's, we're sitting there having lunch together and he's holding this big pick that's going, that goes right through his head. It was really quite <laughs> remarkable. With his eyeball just hanging there. <laughs> and we're just talking, he's having lunch. It was very funny. But it looks so real, though. They, uh, they did all, this, all the special effects done in Hollywood. Yeah. They made all the done down there. Um, all the actors who had uh, dummies made of, of their bodies went down to California to do it. I, I didn't have one, of course, because I don't get killed. Yeah. <laughs> Not as everybody else does, practically. The car on my rock, by the way, was also in big gas. Did you know that? No, I didn't. No, was he? Yeah. I didn't realize that. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, he played uh, he played Helen Shaver's pimp. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. so. I almost interviewed him when I first started uh, podcasting, and then um, he 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 was super busy, and now he's not even on Facebook anymore. So I haven't gotten to interview him. Oh. Oh, I thought he was still on. You sure? I I typed in his name and it wasn't there. I don't know. Oh. I have like two pages, right? I have one page that's just my own personal page, Paul Kelman. Yeah. And I have another page for TJ. Yeah. Uh, I'm just wondering maybe he has a separate page or something. Maybe. I'll, I'll, I'll check. Um, I, I don't know. I'll check. But, now, Carl did really well after, after um, 
after we did gas and that's why he's out of time. He did a lot of work out for that. He has he had a TV series too. Mm-hmm. Wow. And uh, yeah, I thought he was very successful. Yeah. So, uh, whether he was doing what he wanted to do or not, I, I can never tell with uh, with actors. But um, I thought he was, I thought he did really well. He became like a seasoned professional in a very short time. I thought. Yeah, he played James Garner's son in Heart Sounds, and um, he did this great movie called Breaking All the Rules, which I love, um, where he's the lead. He's the lead, and he's a real wise-ass in that movie. It's great. <laughs> yeah, I guess wise-ass is kind of my favorite. Except for, well, you know, we won't say his name. <laughs> well, he's a wise-ass. <clears throat> yeah. What can I say? I'm probably lose fans. I think I've already lost fans because I do. I do a lot of political mm, opinionating. Yeah. <laughs> on Facebook, on my personal <laughs> page, and uh, you know, I think I've lost some people who are like the diehard Republicans or who love Trump. And mm-hmm. um, yeah, I think I, I think I lost a few along the way. They never tell you when somebody leaves, right? So we just try to tell. But I noticed a few people are missing who had very right wing philosophies. Yeah. Maybe I, I, for a while there, I was really making fun a great deal of uh, some of the characters like Trump. Mm-hmm. And uh, maybe I, I went a little too far. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> but it's hard not to. Yeah. yeah. Did, did you know that um, Quentin Tarantino has said that My Bloody Valentine is his favorite slasher movie of all time? <laughs> <laughs> he should he should hire just about everybody in that movie. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. He probably could you know, he, he probably could have done a better remake. <laughs> well, there's a the big topic of the, of the last decade, you know. Yeah. Why 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 is there not been a sequel? People are always asking me. And I can't I, I have no answer for that except that I know that Mahalka and maybe a couple of other people have tried, mm-hmm. and for some reason, somehow, Paramount, you, they weren't interested, instead we did a remake, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was like 2009 or something, uh, which I didn't see, by the way. I, I have it. I have the DVD or the Blu-ray or whatever it is, or, or both, if there were two. Um, like I, I buy them all. I mean, I keep a, a memorabilia, you know, section of from my buddy Valentine, but I uh, I've never seen it, so I don't I don't like to know anything about it. But I, I you know, in the age of remakes, that's what they're doing. Everything is a remake these days. Yeah. Same thing. Fall, fall away somewhere. But did you see it? The the remake, yeah, I didn't like it. No? No. I, mean, I like what's his name from uh, Supernatural. I think he's really good. Good actor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's a good actor, but just the movie, I didn't think, just, it didn't live up to it. No. No. Well, you know, there's always a comparison, right? Yeah. Then, uh, you know, they're pretty safe doing a remake because, you know, it's, it's 37 years, or whatever, and I'm not a huge, over 30 years since since the original, so I guess they just didn't think that there was a big... And, you know, it didn't do very well at the box office when it came out. Mm-hmm. It was a, a kind of a dud. <clears throat> it international. Uh, I played all over the world. I saw my name in white from in uh, New York and Manhattan. Yeah, I thought that was pretty cool. But other than that, it didn't really do well at the box office. So yeah. I don't even think that it caught on. As no, there wasn't a big fan base because of it. But as the years rolled by, and people started watching it when they were children, and then they grew up. And yeah. Valentine's Day would watch it again and then they showed it to their kids and then their kids grew up and they showed it to their kids. So now over 30, 40 years, you've got these, this generational uh, evolution of, of fans for this one movie, which was actually quite a phenomenon. This yeah. Thing, you know? Yeah. And uh, yeah, then it's more popular now than it's ever been. Yeah, I'm sure Paramount was... 
disappointed the movie didn't do well because they were coming off of Friday the 13th becoming a huge hit, and they probably thought that this movie was going to be just as popular. But then they started doing more and more sequels to Friday the 13th, and then that helped them out big time. Yeah, well, that's one thing you would never want to see. You know, my bloody Valentine 4. I don't know, maybe it would. I, I kind of doubt it. I mean, how much can you do? It lets you get out of the mind. But, and that's where all the uh, interest was. I think half of it was just that it took place in the mind. So that gave you a whole new set of rules to play with. You know? Yeah. The horror. It, uh, it yeah, so that, that part was pretty interesting. You know, it was a little rough. It was just very difficult uh, shooting down there. It wasn't that piece of, it wasn't a, a cakewalk, as they say. It was hard. It was very difficult. Yeah. Um, but really, the whole movie, because what happened was, I think it was like in the first two weeks, mm-hmm. Aramark had seen the rushes and they bought it. Oh. I got, I mean, so we're, we're all like two, three weeks into the shoot, and now Aramark bought it. So now the deadline is locked. Like it has to be finished by a certain time, mm-hmm. a, you know, a certain date, at a certain budget. You know, if Kaimont will, will go through with the deal, I guess, if all those prerequisites are checked off. So the pressure was really on that we had to do it and do it, you know, do it well, but do it fast. So that's always the big deal. You know, once the, once the pressure is on, then it doesn't let up at all. Yeah. Until it's done, you know. Yeah. So we had a few weeks and they had to get it done and finished and out there for, you know, all the post-production. Uh, I mean, they got it out within, I don't even remember how long, eight months, I think, maybe, mm-hmm. you know, afterwards. Pretty, pretty fast turnaround. Maybe it was six months, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Anyway, it was whatever it was. <clears throat> yeah, it t- opened up, uh, yeah, it opened up all, in all kinds of theaters, you know, but like I said, it wasn't a big deal back then, you know. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, TJ was... I am fine now. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, TJ was my nickname growing up, but not because of this movie. <laughs> oh. It, it was because okay. I have my father's namesake, so Tommy Jr. is what um, it stood for. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know what TJ stands for? Um, his TJ, your TJ in the movie? No. Yeah? You don't know? No. Thomas Jeffy. Thomas Jeffy. Oh, okay. Yes, Jesse. Oh, Jesse. Thomas Jesse. Okay. Yeah. yeah, because she calls me Jesse sometimes. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, and T stands for Thomas with Tom. Mm-hmm. And uh, even I didn't know that, to be honest with you. I just found that out last year. <laughs> <laughs> I never really thought of it. I thought, oh, well, he's just called TK. But it's a, you know, it became a nickname, because I always spell it T-E-E, yeah. little J-A-Y. Or just with the two initials, TJ. Because I sign a lot of autographs, like, even though I don't do the cons or get out to do this, yeah. meet the people. People send me their, um, he send me whatever, anything from from the record albums, from the, uh, from the, you know, from the movie, mm-hmm. to, um, to anything. Gifts, posters, helmets, <laughs> you name it. <laughs> yeah. I, I do it all through the, I do it all through, you know, the post. But, um, it's, it works out. It works out. I, I, would, I wouldn't like to, uh, before I really can't do anything, I really would like to be able to do at least one card and meet as many of the fans as I can. Oh, yeah. That would be, that would be, that would be cool. That would be you know? great. Yeah. I mean... You know, it'd be great if they got you over here in California. You know, I go to all the cons all over California, you know. So yeah. that'd be great to see at one. But uh, yeah. I was curious, though, do you, do you have any uh, good stories about being in Black Roses? Uh, Black Roses. I, I don't know. I've never seen it. you seen it? Yes. Oh, you did, eh? Yeah. So what do you see? All I am is... I, I just like two seconds worth in the film or something. Yeah, it's 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 a, it's a, it's a trippy yeah. it's a trippy you know heavy metal horror movie, 
and um, uh, Julie Adams is in it. She was a sweet lady. I met her at one of her last conventions. That's the original, what's his name, Hulk, uh, his, his wife at the time. Uh, well, she was she was in the creature from the Black Lagoon. Yeah, wasn't mm-hmm. voice man the Hulk? No, no. I, actor who plays the Hulk? No, Gino. Gino. No, Julie Adams was married to somebody famous though. Um, I, I'm sure I remember who it was. Well, what part did she play in Black Rose? She was the blonde, right? No, no, she was the uh, the mother. I don't know. I, I didn't see it hardly any of it. I didn't even know what was going on at the time. Yeah. <laughs> I just did it for, oh, I can't remember how it happened. Sometimes, somehow, somebody talked me into doing it. So I did it. But I really didn't see hardly any of it at all. And I, I've never seen it. I, I do. I, it's on DVD, right? I, I think it's on DVD, yes. Yeah, okay. So I have a copy of it. You know, the one, uh, the one movie I do not have is Gas. Yeah, I don't even think Gas is on DVD. No, it's not. It was on, uh, but it was on VHS. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. It's on VHS. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I tried, I found one on Etsy or, not Etsy, but the other one. You know, one of those. Uh, what do you, what uh, uh, What is it called? Blu-ray? The G V Blu-ray? You know, I'm talking about the, the, the site where they sell shit, you know? Oh, okay. What's it called? You know, anyway, I saw a copy, a VHS copy of, of Cats for $190. Wow. That's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, you know. Yeah. Well, not a yeah, but there was no other. I couldn't find any other. So I, I don't know. I've been looking around, so I'm hoping that some... Some wonderful fan might have two copies somewhere, or knows of a copy, mm-hmm. and send it to me as a gift or something. It would be really <laughs> hard to find. I, mean, I guess I wouldn't mind like seeing it once again, just to see how it really was. As mm-hmm. you say, it was a bit funny sometimes. I'd like to see that. Yeah. I, I need to see so it again, we, too. We, we enjoyed doing that film. It was a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. You know? Like I said, we were, we were working with some really crazy comedians, like Peter Ackroyd and... Howie. Um, Howie was pretty, yeah, a real nut bar back then. <laughs> he was very young, too. He was like 22 or something like that. Um, <laughs> and they had a He did a whole scene with uh, Donald Sutherland, and he never, ever met him. <laughs> they only shoot point of view, right? Yeah. So that's it. They don't have to be in the same room, even. Uh, I thought that was pretty, pretty funky way to shoot. Yeah, it happens. You know, that's the way it is. Yeah. That's how it goes, can you think? It's just that I just think that it's uneven to to let an industry grow on being kind of totally dependent on American uh, American know-how and American actors and whatever else that uh, the prerequisites to actors shooting cheaply in Canada. And Toronto goes out of its way to accommodate film shoots, you know. Mm-hmm. You can walk down all kinds of places in Toronto, especially during the summer or spring too, and you'll just get some places around the city, you'll see all these movie trucks and little bagels and stuff. You know, sometimes two, three films are, are shooting in the city at the same time and a couple of TV series. Huh. So it's not like that nothing's going on here. I mean, I'm not saying it's, you know, it was for a time. It's just, it's still very Americanized as opposed to Canadian identity coming out and mm-hmm. being a difference. You know, really, but, you know, the culture, you mentioned <coughs> something. <And> Canada's pretty <coughs> well known for, for <laughs> I'll bless you. You don't sound too good. I know, just coughing. Like, you know, it's nice at this time of year. Nope. I just get the phlegm in my throat, that's all. <laughs> But I was curious, though. I was curious, yeah. though. In the years between My Bloody Valentine and Black Roses, um, what were you doing? Were you doing theater? I did. I worked with the same theater for, oh, the better part of 15 years. Um, yeah, it was a real, it 
was an amazing experience. It was a theater in Toronto called Theatre Pass the Rye, which in French means theater beyond the wall, the wall being the wall between you and the audience. So in other words, there's no separation between the audience and the actor. That's the idea behind the theater. And um, we did a lot of improvisation. We improvised plays. Um, and I can't even think about how many plays I did there during that period. So yeah. I also directed plays there. Yeah. I also designed plays there. Yeah. I've always did the design there as well. And then, um, yeah, but I said I was there for about 15 years. Mm-hmm. We with the same theater company. And that's really great because you 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 build up this, this whole, uh, I, what, this kind of, um, what's the word I'm trying to think of? Mm-hmm. You, it, you, you come up with a, a unique uh, flavor, a unique... Um, when, when a collective gets, which was a collective, right? So when a collective gets together, and it really, uh, they really merge, and it becomes a, a brand new entity. And yeah. really what we did is we created <clears throat> this kind of theater. Mm-hmm. Not that it had never been done before, but it had never been done this way, and not with Canadian content. So we originated Canadian plays for 15 years. It was an amazing thing to do. And it was, you know, really difficult, but at the same time, I, 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 I just loved it. Yeah. You know, I, I haven't acted in theater in all, like, I mean, it was that Berlin way, way before. Oh. In 1995, maybe, would be the last time I did anything in theater. Mm-hmm. Maybe before. I really did leave the whole thing and go off on... I've had, like, three different professions since. Uh, I had a... I was a designer. I had my own... Uh, uh, my own fashion boutique with them in, in Toronto. Oh, nice. So, yeah, I designed and, and we, you know, we sold clothes, basically, for fashion, if you want to call it that. It was more street fashion, a lot of punk stuff. We're really into a lot of really, some really interesting stuff. I, I brought in a lot of British styles and stuff. And, and then our, our store became really well known with the rock groups. And uh, we had all kinds of people who used to shop at my store. And so it was a whole other thing. Yeah. I went out to rock groups and stuff and they go out, you know, they look great. And um, there, we did do a play. I produced a play with a, 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 a co-director from New York. We did this um, uh, this major kind of punk style play that was really, really. It was just very wild. We had a lot of fun with that. It was pretty crazy. Um, and after that, I got into the technology, like I said, virtual reality. I did that for ten years. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I was a little a little ahead of my time, or you know, the world wasn't ready yet for virtual reality. Which, and it's just barely starting to take off now. You know, twenty five years later. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> so, you know, do you do you have any regrets of giving up acting? Uh, do I have regrets? Well, yeah, I, I guess uh, anybody would. I just. You know, what happened was I went through a very bad time just uh, during and just the beginning of doing my buddy on time and then afterwards for the next uh, seven years or so. I had a yeah. marriage that didn't work out. Mm-hmm. Uh, when marriage just fall apart, things, things go pretty crazy. Uh, yeah. And, I, you know, I was a drinker back then. And I, I like I liked my... my uh, I like my drink, so I, you know, I would say I was an alcoholic for uh, a lot of the time. Mm-hmm. It happens to a lot of actors, but I think I think we just uh, after I left the acting profession, then there was you know then I could you know just devote my time to drinking for a while. <laughs> In fact, I even went. I, went, I know it, it's fashionable now, but it wasn't fashionable back then. But I went into uh, to uh, a rehab. Yeah. Not 19, not, oh, actually, it was 1990 that I went into a rehab. And, uh, yeah. So uh, there, was, there was a struggle there to get back. 
on your feet, you know. And my, you know, some make it, some don't. I seem to have made it. Um, I, I don't drink that much anymore, hardly at all. But um, yeah, I had to give that up. Yeah, I've been. I've been. Anyway, I didn't have to. Yeah, I've been sober five years now, following a car accident. Oh dear. Yeah. Oh, yes. I got the worst of the injuries between me and my now ex-best friend. Uh, it was pretty bad. I broke my leg in seven places. I, I was in a coma for 30 days. It was just a mess. Well, how old were you with that happened? I was 31 and a half. Now I'm 36. Five, six years ago. Yeah. Oh, that doesn't sound good. Yeah. So have you recovered totally? Oh yeah, I've recovered. I mean, I'm always going to have arthritis in my leg, but other than that, I've recovered pretty good. Yeah, I, we actually had um, a couple of um, we had a major accident or two during the shoot of uh, I believe Valentine. Oh yeah. I had a car accident. Yeah, I had a car accident while we were shooting. <sighs> wow. And it was it was it was a bad accident. Mm-hmm. I got hurt, and a, and a, an extra got hurt, and uh, and I wrecked the car. I think mm-hmm. <laughs> it was pretty. <laughs> but, you know, it's really unusual for it to happen like while you're shooting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's really too bad. Um, I think they probably they probably get you know a shot. Have a look at it every once in a while or something, or have a laugh at my expense. But um, it, it was really serious at the time. Yeah. Sympathize with you. I've been in about five car accidents in my life. So, wow. luckily, I, I, you know, I've escaped each one. And, uh, That's good. Yeah, except for that one. That one in my boy's all time that I, I, I injured my back. And I think what it is is I injured some nerves in my back. So since that movie, believe it or not, I've had I've had at least six major episodes in the last forty years where my back was completely wrecked. It came back several times, and I, you know, like I was out of it in terms of being able to do anything, even walk, for like six, seven weeks at a time. Yeah. And like thirty years later, you know. It's still here. Wow. So, you know, and as you get older, well, you know what happens, right? I mean, if you wreck your leg or something in a car accident at 30, believe me, you're going to feel it at 65. Oh, yeah. You know? <laughs> so, you don't have much choice. Anyway, yeah. yeah. It's all water under the bridge now, but it, it was, at the time, it was pretty serious stuff. And, uh, yeah. We had also a couple of accidents in the mine. That were scary, um, and uh, yeah, it wasn't an easy shoot. I'll tell you that much because it is a dangerous place in the first place, mm-hmm. in a mine, you know. And uh, and then you got all kinds of things that can go wrong because you got you know wood car trains, you know, going up and down and deep and at a certain pace, and you got you know gases in the air mm-hmm. and the big lights and there's all kinds of stuff happening. And you're down like, you're, you're so far down that you can't even think about getting to the surface. It's just, you know, luckily, I, I actually am claustrophobic. Um, I mean, normally, and I don't like really tiny little spaces. Yeah. But I wasn't, I wasn't claustrophobic down there. I don't know why. The only thing that was really hard on myself, and it made a few other members in the cast, was you can't smoke in the mine. <laughs> you know, so we had to we had to do like the miners do. We had to chaw tobacco. Mm-hmm. Unbelievable! If you've ever chewed tobacco, have you ever tried chewing tobacco? Uh, no, I have no interest in that. <laughs> it's an acquired taste. I'll tell you that much. Anyway, we got we start to get used to it, and yeah. we actually started to feel like miners. I have to walk. We were always dirty, <laughs> doing tobacco and spitting. And, <laughs> you know, we actually did, we lived in a real mine. We did do that. We have that with the miners for a while. And, you know, we, we, we went right down to the face of the mine, which is where they're actually doing the drilling. Yeah. That's usually about like five feet high and about six feet wide. And you've got a three and a half foot wide drill. That's moving like, you know, like, I don't know how many rotations per second. Mm-hmm. Things 
really dangerous and you're standing like six inches away from it and there's no other room. Mm-hmm. They just flurrying away, you know? Yeah. You just moved over a little bit. Bye bye. Okay. You know? Yeah. I don't know how they do it those guys. I know that by the time we came back up after we spent like half a day down there with, with the miners. And we came back up. We took our, our goggles off and we looked like reverse raccoons, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was really it's really quite funny. And it just kinda uh, and it was all over you. I mean you were just uh you turned you know, you would look like black sooty with that little little bit of glimmer to the to the dirt. Uh that that cool glimmer, you know, and it's all over you. It's really uh, I don't know how to do it. Yeah. Soon, you know, and end up with some kind of a lung disease by the time like they're forty to fifty, somewhere in there. Miners mm-hmm. die dying up. You know, they get the FEMA and all kinds of other lung related uh injuries. Mm-hmm. Uh, over at over twenty five years mining, you're uh, you're pretty well cooked and done by the time, you know, you're sixty years old. You get a lot of young miners who are the sons of the older miners who die. And uh, uh, it goes on generationally like that. You know, nobody lives to be past a certain age in the, in the male, you know, uh, generation. So it's quite, I don't know, it's interesting to talk to these guys when they know damn well what they're doing is killing them. Yeah. You know? Uh, I, don't, I, I don't get it myself. I mean, I can understand the tradition and how mining becomes something that, uh, that is your family and all the other minor families. Or you all understand each other because you know you all go through the same things. And it really becomes a community around that one particular piece of labor. And uh, it's a, you know it's a big deal when they, when the mine closes, like the one at Sydney Mines. All these people are now out of work. After generations of mining, you know, mm-hmm. I, I, we, we we got into that. We understood, you know, that this was you know, a serious matter, really, not just a joke. Like, yeah, we, you know, we were trying to make fun of everything, but, but at the same time, we understood how serious it was for these people. Yeah, yeah. There's nothing much else to do, you know, except for mining and fishing. You know. Although they have good technology, like uh, good uh, internet um, in, uh, in Nova Scotia, I, 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 they're pretty progressive that way. Mm-hmm. They have a Dalhousie University, I think it's called, and um, uh, they, they they have the courses in virtual reality. You can actually get a uh, a degree in that um, in communications and stuff. They're pretty well far ahead there. It's also a beautiful country. I don't know if you saw that in the film or not, but it's very pretty. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, do you, so what are you doing these days? Do you have anything you'd like to promote? <laughs> well, <laughs> excuse me. Um, well, come find me on Facebook. Um, I always I accept everybody's friend requests unless I always check everybody out to see if, they're, if they look like they're a real person or not. Oh, yeah, you got to do that. Um, yeah, I have to because I get all kinds of requests all the time. And uh, a lot of them, too, you know, you're know, you an older guy and you're an ex actor or whatever. They think you have money. You should get a lot of these women, you know, <laughs> need to be whatever they are. Yeah. And then they, you know, they want you to go to their website where you can, you know, buy their pictures and stuff like that. So I, I have to, like, block all these attempts by whatever. Yeah. Selling sex. It's really, really weird. They think I'm really wealthy or something. And of course, I'm not. So, yeah. <laughs> they're, they're, they're knocking at the wrong door. Anyway, uh, what are you asking me? Oh, promote. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, uh, I don't know. Have you gotten your copy of the new Blu ray that just came out? I haven't gotten it yet, but it's on my list. Oh, okay. Okay. I just got my copy. Uh, I got a copy a couple of days ago. Uh, it's, a, it's actually a, a promotional thing that you get when you a guy. <laughs> but it came out, I actually bought it right away. Mm-hmm. I have another one coming for having got the interview. They also give me a copy. So, um, yeah, I'd like to promote that. I think everybody should buy one. And uh, you can also get them to me autographed, or you can send yours to me, and I'll autograph it. Um, it's a, a nominal fee of... I can't remember what it is right now. So somebody would have to. But they ask me. I have a little blurb that I throw at them so that they know how to do it and the pricing and all that stuff and why. Um, and 
I, I try. I, I don't get involved in politics because if I re, if I really thought that we could, you know, change the world, you know, then I would. But I just I just you know sit back and watch this you know shit show. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're a bit of a cynic, though, right? Somewhat, yeah. It's just I don't know. Just it, it, no. it's never been a big interest in me, in, in me you know, because it's it's stressful, you know. So I try to not. I try to live a stress free life. Yeah, that's a difficult one, but, you know, I think stress also makes it exciting, but, you know, uh, there's good stress and there's bad stress, right? Right. 
bad stress is Trump and bad stress is having a, 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 you know, an accident that really wrecks your life. These are, you know, these are very distressing situations, but, you know, what they say, although if you're a cynic, maybe not, but there's that silver lining they always talk about philosophically. Mm-hmm. You know, there, are, there are lessons in life, right, that you're going to learn because they happen to you. Yeah. And you wonder, you don't know why something happened to you. And yeah. later on, maybe 10 years later, you realize, you know, that put you in a position where you had to think a certain way, and that helped you do such and such, and there it is. You know, so it turns out that wasn't such a bad thing after all. Yeah. I mean, your, your, knee, your knee might not like it, but your brain might be better off for it, and maybe even your heart. I believe in people can change. You know how some people say, you know, once, you, once you're a certain type of person, that's it. You know, you're like that for the rest of your life, regardless. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't think that's true. I think people can change. And uh, change really like, in, in a big way. Yeah. Like, for example, people who come out of jail, for example, or a penitentiary, you know, some of them, some of them are able to change their lives, turn everything around for themselves. Others, not so much. Yeah, I don't think you can change. You could change like a sociopath, you know, like Harvey Weinstein or something. Uh, that's a whole other thing. I, I'm yeah. not like your average street person. If there is such a thing, yeah, they up in jail. You know, but these guys, all well, there, they're they're a whole different thing. They're like they're the sharks in the ocean. Those guys, you know? yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Paul, I think you so. Yeah. Paul, thank, I thank you so much for coming on today. Um, this is a great uh, Valentine's Day present to all the horror fans out there. That's what I wanted to say. I want to wish everybody a happy Valentine's Day. Yes. Well, sir. We break your heart. Yeah. <laughs> Well, sir, you have a great evening over there, and like I said, I hope you get to do the convention scene um, in uh, 2020. Right, right. Yeah, uh, there is a chance, I don't want to say this out loud to many people, but there is a chance I might be doing one con this year. Hmm. And that'll be announced at least several months before, so that people can get ready if they want to make a trip and, um, and to be there. But I can't, yeah, that's about as much I, w- I want to say. But okay. anyway, yes, happy Valentine's Day. Find me on Facebook. Uh, let's see who you are. Maybe you'll be as interesting to me as so many other fans have been. And, um, yeah, I hope everybody has a really good uh, Valentine's Day. And, you know, mm-hmm. watch the movie. Awesome. Thank you, sir. Be here and talk with Okay, take care now. It was a pleasure. It sure was. Okay, bye-bye. Okay, ciao. Bye. Well, there you have it. Paul Kelman. Ain't he a cool dude? Uh, Very deep, insightful, very talkative guy. I like him an awful lot. Um, If you like this video, everyone, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Add me as a friend on Facebook. Join my Tommy Kovac Comedian page on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram and all that fun stuff. Well, that's all the time we have this week on Splat from the Past. Until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes. Happy Valentine's Day.